Swedish police nab culprit in Cadbury egg heist. <laughs> now, it's not clear what Joby Poole was planning for this year's Easter feast, but if his snack plans were any indication, it would have been an epic celebration. That's because police arrested Poole for stealing a trailer containing 200,000 of those little Cadbury cream oh my eggs. Gosh. You know the ones I'm talking of. It looks like a yolk inside. I, they're kind of disturbingly delicious, right? The haul was valued at approximately $37,000. That's an amount that local police said was extravagant. <laughs> Sorry, dad joke time. <laughs> Police say that Poole broke into an, an industrial unit in Telford, UK, before driving off with the goods in a previously stolen tractor. <clears throat> Prosecutor Owen Beale claims that the crime had to have been premeditated. He said this is clearly organized criminal matter because you don't just happen to learn about a trailer with that kind of valuable cargo just being available. Right? Now that's, um, that's from the New York Times a little over a month ago. The eight o'clockers thought it was an April Fool's article, but I have to tell you, I cannot make this stuff up. It really happened. So happy Easter 2023. Now, I know that that was a bit of a lighthearted look at the question of, well, what do we expect these days anyway? What do we usually expect from people, from the world, around us? I mean, what do we expect when we open the news every day? Or, you know, when we get that 5,000th phishing call or email or text that shows up and just, hmm, confirms the worst of what we think about humanity. <clears throat> Because I have to tell you that every time that I do that, every time I read another story about gross fraud or abuse of power or devastating violence, a little bit more of my own faith in humanity kind of dies. Now, John Lennon, who I think we all know is pretty famous for his optimis optimistic imaginings of what our human potential should and could be, was known to have said, everything will be okay in the end. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. <laughs> so with that perspective in mind, I'm gonna turn my opening question on its ear and ask us, what did we all expect when we got out of bed this morning and made our way to church today? What did we come here for? What did we expect? Resurrection, right? We came here today because we were expecting resurrection. And you know what? It's no wonder because we are hungry, hungry for resurrection given what the usual day looks like in our world. And Easter is the day that challenges us to expect more than what we usually get what we usually get along with the rest of humanity that just seems to be playing itself out, out there. Because Easter Day is the day when we expect the good, in fact, I wanna say the great news, that even when it feels like things are not okay, that's not the end of the story as far as God is concerned. We're here because Easter is a day when we get to renew again our faith and our hope that God can and will bring life and renewal and wholeness when we thought that all of that was lost to us. It's a day when we get to shout with confidence, Alleluia, Christ is risen, and then we get to respond. The Lord has risen indeed, Alleluia. Excellent. 
excellent. Never gets old that, right? But it also, it takes an act of faith, doesn't it? And we're not alone in that, because if we listen to that gospel story today, it seems like it took an act of faith for those two women named Mary to make their way to Jesus' tomb at dawn on the first day of the week. You see, they had watched Jesus die a brutal death at the hands of the Roman authorities just a couple of days earlier. They'd seen many of their friends and fellow followers of Jesus and just kind of melt away into the shadows, denying any knowledge of Jesus when things got tough. Yet here are these two women at first light rushing to the place where they had lain Jesus just a few days before. There's something unique about Matthew's telling of the gospel. I'm not sure if you noticed it, but they're not carrying spices or oils to anoint Jesus's body. They do in the other three gospels, but not in this one. It seems like these women in Matthew's telling of it do not expect to find death. Could it be that they're like us? That they expect resurrection? Could it be that they're looking for a living Jesus? Well, if you think about it, why shouldn't they? I mean, they had, after all, heard Jesus tell them what would happen that, you know, he was probably going to get killed for the audacity of healing and teaching about God's love for all. But, you know, give him three days, and he would come back from the dead. Jesus said it at least three times that we know of in Matthew's telling. But you know what? It seems like these two women of the name Mary might have been the only ones who were listening. Might have been the only ones with the faith enough to think that, ooh, this might actually be something that's going to come to pass. It could be possible. They haven't given up hope that God could still turn things around this far into the game. And you know what? Given all that they've been through, I think t that that takes a huge act of faith and some significant courage. That earthquake, it must have been something because those guards, they fainted on the spot. But not those two ladies, uh-uh. Because I think that when you expect resurrection, it reframes how you experience all kinds of things. Even that angel glowing all white like hot lightning who just rolls that stone away and sits down on top of it like it was nothing. Even that angel does not send them rushing for the hills in fear. Hmm, they got some gumption, those ladies. I mean, you can see they're pretty shaken and can you blame them? but not enough to get in the way of the joy that fills their hearts when the angel confirms for them all their wildest hopes. He has been raised. Come, come and see. Now, I'm a realist, so I can't imagine that they had fully put away, must have been an equal measure of fear and doubt held alongside all of that hope and faith. Can't imagine they really managed to set that aside until they saw Jesus standing right there before them and welcoming them. You can almost feel it. All of those fears draining away as they get down and greet Jesus by touching his feet, which was the traditional way that they would greet a teacher or honored person in Jesus's time. Now, what they experienced was clearly nothing less than resurrection. But I also think it was so much more than what they 
could have imagined or have expected, and they have no idea how to properly explain it. See, any of us who have experienced the miracle of new life know that it always takes you by surprise, leaves you without words to fully explain what you've just seen come into being before you. So it's no wonder, it's no wonder that they are so eager to take up their charge, to share the news with their brothers and with everyone else and start to try and make sense of what has taken place. So what is this resurrection that they experienced and what is it that makes it so frightening and so joyful that we too get to participate in on Easter morning, 2023. The great thing is this Easter liturgy, it helps us out. It helps us answer that question. What is this resurrection that we've come here to expect? That's because this Easter liturgy is our empty tomb. It's the place where we get to first meet the risen Christ. It's the place where we can start to understand the miracle of resurrection anew this year for 2023 for ourselves. Now, the great thing about Matthew's telling of the resurrection is that Christians we know have been reading it as the first <coughs> gospel of Easter, at least right on back to the year 215. They used to read it on the Easter Vigil. Our lectionary lets us read it on Easter morning, on year A, so here we are with it today. But that's how they used to start every year in the dark. This would be the proclamation that they got, the one where you know what's happening and what's expected. So Christians, for almost 2,000 years, have come together each spring to remember this story in this particular way so that we too get to see our own hope right there in the middle of that story of Jesus' resurrection. And you know what else? This service, it is packed with images of resurrection, kind of overflowing with an abundance of ways that we can describe and make concrete what's still very hard for us to grasp, even though we actually know what to expect. There's deliverance, Deliverance from brokenness and restoration to wholeness. There's freedom from all that enslaves us. There's victory over death and its destructive power. There's forgiveness and compassion. God's loving generosity confirmed for us. There's reconciliation, closeness, a reunion of all things and all people with each other and with God. There's joining of us, too, making us a part of the risen Jesus. And finally, there's light, the light of resurrection that shines in us and makes us alive with Christ. That presence, that light, it's there in each and every one of us. So. Why so many images of resurrection, you might ask? I think it might be so that every one of us can find at least one way that we can start to take on board this incomprehensible and amazing offer of new life with God in Jesus. Now, we all know that much of our culture has lost touch with this story. Even though it's God's love letter to all of humanity, not enough of us get to hear it and read it anew each year. But that doesn't mean that God isn't still showing us at every turn. God's out there in the world letting us know all the time. We just need to look for it in all of the fresh ways that God is saying, come and see. I mean, as you surf your daily news feeds, I invite you to look for stories of transformation. They might be buried among all that other headline-grabbing tragedy. I mean, who gets to pick the headlines? The people do, right? But 
God's light is out there shining forth in the joining of people together who once felt isolated, in all of the creative ways that we are moving to rebuild and change and overcome the forces to keep us apart and calling us into being new communities. So as you see all the dire stories of humanity's ongoing favors, remind yourself of all the ways that God shows us over and over again God's love for each and every one of us. I mean, dare I say, you can even find it when you go to the movies. Because there's lots of stories being told, and on television too, images of resurrection and the power of transformation working in us. It's not hard to find. I have to say, it's even in some of the places that you wouldn't expect it. Like, I don't know, have any of you seen Frozen? <laughs> it was huge when our kids were like tweens. Uh, I don't know if it's still something that kids, is it? Okay, good. Because I'm going to spoil it a little bit. Um, anyway, but I have to say right in the middle of it, and this caught me totally by surprise the first time I saw this, but right in the middle of all that glorious singing and the high Disney drama, we discover that the only way to thaw a frozen heart is through an act of perfect self-giving love. Sound familiar? Yeah, I mean, let's think about it. That movie is full of images of transformation from a life that's been lived in fear and isolation, not just individuals, but whole communities. And it's about the transformation that they find coming from what is almost like a frozen living death into a life that's lived more fully in connection and loving relationship with family and with community and with the whole country around them. And it's not the only movie where you can find that stuff. I challenge you to go out and look more closely. So why do you think God keeps showing resurrection to us in so, so many ways? I think it's so that each and every day, not just once a year, but each and every day, we get the chance to recognize the new life that God, through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, is working in us, through us, and all around us. You see, resurrection, it's always unfolding in the world. So, what were we expecting? Resurrection, right? When you expect resurrection, it comes to reframe how we experience all kinds of things. So God is always there, always beckoning us to come and see all the signs of renewal that remind us and make real this promise for all of us and for our world. Reminding us so that we, like the two women named Mary, can share this news of new life in Jesus Christ. And to that, there is only one response that I think can do it justice, and that is hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>